Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening. Here we are again studying logic. We want to continue today to study the semantics of symbolic logic. Now remember, in general, a language is considered in terms of its syntax and its semantics. The syntax of a language consists in its vocabulary and its grammar, while the semantics are found in the theory of meaning for that language. The vocabulary gives us the elements of a language, the grammar tells us how we may combine those elements into expressions, and the semantics would then tell us what those expressions mean. So semantics is a study of meaning. The logical meaning of an expression in simple or sentential symbolic logic is understood as characterizing the truth or falsity of sentences which express those propositions. So sometimes the part of symbolic logic we're studying is called truth functional logic. Now logicians define meaning in terms of possible truths. To know the meaning of a sentence is to know which possible situations or circumstances make it true and which circumstances make it false. For example, suppose I wanted to know if a student understood the meaning of the sentence, Mill's ethical system is utilitarian in nature. I might describe various possible ethical systems then, and then ask after each description which one matched the idea of utilitarianism. I could do that on a test. How the student answered those questions would quickly show me whether she knows what Mill's ethical system uh, being called utilitarian means. Or what is meant by such sentences as, Bob knows that aliens exist my neighbor Bob. Well, we could ask whether or not the sentences would be true in various possible situations to get at what knows means. <laughs> because philosophers like to think about the oddest things, and one thing we like to think about is what does it mean to know something, and what does it mean when you use it in a sentence? So what does it mean when we use it in a sentence, Bob knows that aliens exist? Suppose Bob had been raised from a child by his parents to believe that aliens exist. They're sort of UFO enthusiasts. Would that make it true that he knows that aliens exist? Suppose he had an encounter with a shining light from a flying saucer in which he said he received messages from aliens. Would that make it true that Bob knows that aliens exist? Because he said it was true? that he had a vision from aliens? Or suppose that he really did have an encounter with aliens, and they shined a light on him and sent him a message. Right? Would that make the sentence true? Is that what we would mean? Now, these questions are just considered to help us begin to develop an intuition into the meaning of the sentence, Bob knows that aliens exist, and in general, to help us understand the meaning of that word knows, in extraordinary circumstances. Do extraordinary claims need extraordinary proof, for example? What are the conditions for truth of such claims? And the whole guiding assumption by me either trying to find out if a student knows what utilitarianism means, or in me trying to find out what knows means when Bob says he knows aliens exist, the whole guiding assumption in those investigations is that to know the meaning of a proposition is to know which possible situations make that sentence true. Or as philosophers like to put it, the meaning of a proposition is found in its truth conditions. The truth conditions for propositions are rules which specify the possible situations in which sentences containing that term are true, and the possible situations in which sentences containing that term are false. And so far, we've learned the truth conditional semantics for our five logical operators. The definitions we learned, summarized in their truth tables, explain their meanings in terms of the possible situations in which sentences containing them are true, and the possible situations in which sentences containing them are false. We learn to say that such propositions have truth value, by which we mean they are either definitely true or definitely false. We also learn that in each possible situation, each proposition has one and only one of these truth values. It's either true 
or it's false, whether I know it or not. Uh, if I state aliens exist, it's true that they exist, or it's false that they exist, even though I don't know if they exist or not. This assumption is called the principle of bivalence, and the kinds of logic that are based on the principle of bivalence and the assumption that meaning is found in truth conditionals are called classical assumptions in logic and make what we're doing uh, classical logic. There are also non-classical logics, but that's for another class. <laughs> now, so far we've learned to define the meanings of the five logical operators in terms of their truth conditions. For example, consider the conjunction operator, the ampersand as we're using uh, to symbolize it. If we can join two sentences, Jim is a professor, Jim loves Star Wars, we can, attain, we can obtain a single proposition, a compound one, which states that Jim is a professor and Jim loves Star Wars. And we know from our uh, definition of the meaning of and that this is true if and only if both original sentences are true and otherwise it's false. So the truth conditions for conjunction we learn could be stated as follows. A conjunction is true if both of its conjuncts are true, otherwise it's false. And we know that Jim is a professor and Jim loves Star Wars, if Jim is referring to me anyway, is true and true, which makes it true. To understand these truth conditions is then to understand what conjunction means, or disjunction, or if then, or if and only if, and so on. So now, with that in mind, let's get into the details of calculating truth values. Now, most of us are familiar with the idea of operators from mathematics. Right? And if you will think about uh, arithmetic for a second, you'll recall that there are four basic operators. There's plus, there's minus, there's times, and there's division. Right? And uh, the operators can turn two numbers into one number. The two numbers you start with are known as input values, and what you end up with is called the output value. So plus uh, combines 2 and 5 and gives us 7, and 4, op uh, four, is, uh, two <laughs> 4 and 2 are operated on by the minus sign, and that gives us 2. And 6 and 2 here are operated on by the time sign, which gives us 12, and 9 and 3 are operated on here by the division sign, which gives us 3. And since the operators operate on two input values, they are called binary operators. Now we also have operators that operate uh, on only one number, and that's called a unary operator. And that's the negation sign in math. So we can turn a 4 into a negative 4, like the the, the, uh, the minus sign operates on the 4 and gives us minus 4, or we could go minus minus 4, and that would operate on the 4 to give us positive 4, and so on. Now, arithmetic is blessed or cursed, depending on how you look at it, with an infinite number of possible values that you could put into X and Y slots and Z slots and combine in many, 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 many different ways that goes on from here to infinity. But in logic, we're only concerned with two, true or false. So in parallel with mathematics, and you can see why sometimes this logic is called mathematical logic, right? We have our logical binary operators, the and, the or, the if then, and the if and only if. And we have our logical unary operator, the tilde, the negation. And here too, we have input values and output values. When we input, uh, a true and a false into the AND operator, we get false. True or false gives us true. True then false gives us false. And true then false equals false, and so on. And with our unary operator, if, if the negation operates on one truth value, it turns it into its opposite. And here's the table of our... Uh, of the semantics or the meaning in our language with the various operators. So for example, if I ask you to calculate 
some values, given that A is true, B is false, and C is false, if A, if we put A and B together, that would be putting together true and false, and we know true and false, true and false, joined by the and, are false. And we know that if we join B and C with the V, right, that would give us true or false, and true or false is true. And if we had if B then C, if true then false, if true then false gives us false, right? and um, A if and only if C would be true if and only if false, which would give us false. And the negation of A, which is true, would give us false as our output. And that's how you basically how you calculate truth value. So let's play with this a little bit. There are some truths about the world that are so well known that almost everybody knows them, right? We all know that Clark Kent is Superman. We all know that Batman lives in Gotham City. We all know that Thor is from Asgard. It's true that Clark Kent is Superman. It's true that Batman lives in Gotham City. And it's true that the mighty Thor is from Asgard. No one can doubt it. So, the semantics or meaning of a conjunction is it's true if both its conjuncts are true and otherwise it's false. So somebody said Clark Kent is Superman and Batman lives in Gotham City and we're asked to evaluate that as a whole. Well, that's true and true, so the statement as a whole is true. But if someone said Thor is from Asgard and Superman was born on Venus, that would be to combine a true and a false, which would be false. And if someone made the ridiculous assertion that Batman lives in Paris and Thor is from Asgard, that would be false and true, which is false. And if someone said Thor is from New Jersey and Batman lives in Alabama, that would be false and false, which would be false. Wouldn't it be funny if Thor was from New Jersey and Batman lived in Alabama? Hi, y'all. I'm the Batman. And... I don't even want to attempt what Thor would sound like if he were from New Jersey. You can also know the meaning of or, a disjunction. A disjunction is false if both of its disjuncts is false, otherwise it's true. So if someone said Clark Kent is Superman or Batman lives in Gotham City, that's true or truth. And that makes the whole thing true. Now if someone said Thor is from Asgard or Superman was born on, on Venus, remember again, this is the inclusive or. It's only false if both of its disjuncts are false. Remember the little wiring diagram with the light bulb and battery I introduced you to, right? So when one of those gates is closed, so the power is flowing, it's true that Thor is from Asgard, so the whole thing is true. And similarly here, while it's false that Batman lives in Paris, it's true that Thor is from Asgard, so that little gate is closed, and the power is flowing, and the truth light lights up, and the statement as a whole is true. But if we say Thor is from New Jersey, or Batman lives in Alabama, I'm the Batman, y'all. Um, it's not going to work, because both gates are open, the current won't flow, and the whole thing is false. Now we also know negation has the opposite truth value of the proposition it negates. So if someone said it is false that Clark Kent is Superman, that would be not true, which would make the expression as a whole false. Or if someone said it is false that Thor is from New Jersey, that would be the negation of false, which would make that sentence as a whole true. We've also learned that a conditional is false if its antecedent is true and its consequent is false, and otherwise it is true. It's just the logical meaning of it. The way the current flows in the wires and the light bulbs light up when you hook them up. And that's all we're getting at here. Right? So if someone said if Clark Kent is Superman then Batman lives in Gotham City, that would be true than true, which is true. If someone said if Thor is from Asgard then Superman was born on Venus, that's true than false, and that has the value of false. If someone said if Batman lives in Paris, then, let me go up on the board and fix that, then Thord is from Asgard, that would be false, then true, which is true. 
And if someone said, if Thor is from New Jersey, then Batman lives in Alabama, that would be false than false, which would make the whole thing true. Remember, our formal language doesn't mirror the kind of connotations and overtones and differences of meaning in natural language. We're simply considering the if-then operator considered formally, which sometimes makes it sound pretty weird, but that's the nature of the logical beast we're considering. Welcome to Wonderland. We also learn that a biconditional is true when both of its components have the same truth value, and is false uh, if, well, let me go up on the board again, there I gotta fix this, if both of its components have different truth values. And this is the one that makes most sense to me in Wonderland. True is exactly the same as true, true, right? True is exactly the same as true. Clark Kent is Superman if and only if Batman lives in Gotham City, but Thor is from Asgard if and only if Superman was born on Venus would mean true is exactly the same as false, and that would be false. Similarly, Batman lives in Paris if and only if Thor is from Asgard. Uh, false whoa, if and only if. Got to jump up to the board again, uh, friends. There we go. Fortunately... I have my chalk and eraser. Okay. So Batman lives in Paris if and only if Thor is from Asgard. False is exactly the same as true would make the whole thing false. But Thor is from New Jersey if and only if Batman lives in Alabama. A false statement is exactly the same as a false statement is true. False if and only if false is true. Now happily, or sadly, depending on... <laughs> how you take these things, we can also learn how to evaluate more complex expressions. More fun for us, right? And it's similar to what we did in math. Suppose you had not A plus B divided by C, right? And, and, someone, and your teacher told you A is 2, B is 8, and C is 5. Well, then we'd plug in the numbers and we'd do what's in the innermost parentheses first, 2 plus 8 is 10, that makes 10 divided by 5, which is 2, and then the negation operates on it and gives us negative 2. Similarly, suppose we had a, if a and b, then d. Right? And this is, whole thing is our antecedent, and this is our consequent, and this is our major operator, which is always important to pay attention to, because that's, this, this is, gives us the meaning of the whole sentence. The whole sentence is a conditional, and in the antecedent we have a conjunction. Right? And so if I said A is true, B is false, and D is true, that would give us true and false, then true. And then we do what's in the parentheses first. True and false is, whoa, what is true and false? Is true and false true? No, true and false is false. <laughs> So false than true right, is true right, by our uh, truth table definitions. If you don't believe me, go look it up. And here are some more examples just to help you get into the spirit of the thing. Suppose we say if a and b equals true, x, y equals false, what's the result? Right? What's the meaning of these sentences? Right? Well, a and not y would be true and not false, which would be true and true, which is true. Now, what about the negation of the conjunction of A and y? That would be the negation of true and false, and we do what's in the parentheses first, true and false is false, and that negates the false and gives us true. Similarly here, the negation of if A then B, right? The negation of true than false, so true than false is false, and then we negate it and we get true. Or how about the negation of if A then not B, right? We plug in our truth values, true then not false, not false is true, true then true is true, the negation of true is false. And that's how uh, the game is played. Now, to continue with our fun in Wonderland, think of longer strings. Here, and remember, A and B are true, and X and Y are false, right? Suppose we had, uh, if A, then B and Y. And here I've put the main operators in red, 
right? I put the main operators in red because that's what we want to end up calculating out, the value that will result under the major operator. And so we have um, if A, then B and Y, which is true, then true and false. So true and false is false. The true is just true, and true, then false is false, giving our final value. So the meaning of if A, then B and Y, we say under this interpretation is false. So this is called an interpretation. And we give uh, the interpretation, and then we evaluate the expression, and we get its meaning. Okay, here we're given the expression a and not x, if and only if a or x, under this interpretation. So we plug in our truth values, true and not true, true or false. True or false is true. True and not true is the same as true and false, which is the same as false. False, if and only if true, is false. Here we have... Uh, another uh, string that we're asked to interpret to get its meaning. So we have here, here's the main operator. Always identify the main operator first. So this whole thing is the antecedent and this is the consequent. So first we want to get the meaning of the antecedent. We always start inside the innermost parentheses, right? So we have true and false or if true then false then true. True and false is false. True then false is false. False or false is false. And false then true or true. It's like a tea party in Wonderland. <laughs> I hope you're having as much fun as I am. And in fact, as you can see, Alice has joined us here in our logical uh, tea party. We're having a grand old time and the fun is getting so much fun that fun than which none could be funnier that the Cheshire Cat has decided to enjoy, uh, join us for some more logical discussion. And finally, Professor Lewis Carroll himself has joined us, who wrote a book called Symbolic Logic in the Game of Logic. So welcome to the game, and welcome to the party once again. We've got weeks of fun to go. Now, so fun is this game than which none more fun can be thought that we can learn to determine truth values with unknown values. Because just think about the meaning of this truth table, right? If you think about it, another way to state what it means is if one conjunct is false, then the whole conjunction is false. I mean, let's just think about that. If one conjunct is false, then the whole conjunction is false. So if that's false, it's false. If that's false, it's false. Of course, if they're both false, it's false. Now suppose I told you A and B are true, X and Y are false, and P and Q are unknown. Right? What could we find out if we had Q and X? Well, that's like, who knows what and F. But if we know, no matter what we put here, suppose we put a true there, true and false would be false. Suppose we put a false there. False and false would be false. So no matter what, even though we don't know what this is, we know that the whole thing has to be false. Now what about this one? Not B and P. That's not true and who knows what. It sounds like Wonderland, doesn't it? It's not true and who knows what, right? <laughs> and not true is false, as Tweedledum and Tweedledee have instructed us. And again, if one side of a conjunction is false, we know the whole thing is false. So we don't even have to know what this one is to know that it's false. Similarly, it's sort of the other one in reverse. We know that if one disjunct is true, then the whole disjunct is true. So this means if we have something joined by the V, as long as it has a truth on either side of it, it's going to be true. The only time it'll be false altogether is if it is false. So the caterpillar wanted to test whether Alice was fit to live in Wonderland. So he asked her, right? Well, Alice, if A and B are true and X and Y are false, 
and P and Q are unknown. What about this? Right? Suppose we had Q or not X. That would be who knows what or not F, which would be who knows what are true. But who knows what are true is true. And even more wonderful, what if both values are unknown, right? What if, what if we don't know anything but that it's joined by a V? <laughs> it's getting more and more wonderlandish, right? So A and B are true, X and Y are false, and P and Q are unknown. And suppose we have not P or Q or not, or Q or P, right? Well, there are two possible cases here in Wonderland. We could suppose P is true, or we could suppose P is false. So the old King of Hearts over here is going to suppose P is true, and the old Queen of Hearts is going to suppose P is false. Now suppose P is true. So we plug in true wherever P is. That gives us not true or what the heck or true, which gives us false or what the heck or true. But what the heck or true is true, so false or true gives us true. Queen's not liking this, but the cat makes her think it through. Suppose P is false. Not false or what the heck or false. Gives us true or what the heck or false. But at this point, since we know one side is true, we're never going to know what this is. If it was true or false, it would be true. If it was false or false, it'd be false, but that doesn't matter because true or anything is true, as the Cheshire Cat reminds us. Which makes me think of that great question the Caterpillar asked. Who are you? I mean, seriously, who are we that our brains can work this way <laughs> in such a marvelous fashion, right? That What's in here can come externalized outside of us and computers and machines so that I'm now talking to you through digital technology that arose out of this marvelous game in our minds. Who are you? Who am I? Who are we as human beings? <laughs> One thing we know for sure is we're the living creatures that listen to the Logos and can have a whole lot of fun in doing so. I want to thank you for your kind attention today. I'll be coming at you with more tricks from Wonderland soon.